human beings are a complicated bunch, and sometimes we don't follow logic or uh, or um, or conscious thought. So, um, on that topic, it's actually my privilege today to introduce someone who is, in my opinion, one of the most interesting people on the MIT campus. Um, David Schreier is managing director of MIT's Connection Science Initiative. It's taking the networked world around us and surrounds us and making it more useful to society. So um, he's actually started a number of VC and venture-backed companies, uh, private equity and VC, but uh, has been almost any C-level executive you can think of. Uh, has a back background in both biology and theater uh, from Brown, and is actually quite simply one of the leading minds in innovation today. Uh, so please join me in giving David Schreier a warm welcome. Today. Uh, so thank you for that kind introduction and, and thank you to the four A's for having me here today. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is some of our efforts at MIT to bring the lab into life uh, and do a little bit of reality hacking. Along the way, hopefully we'll provide you some ideas that you might be able to apply in your own work. Um, but first, let's start with some basics. So, who here knows where most psychology research happens? That's right. College freshmen fill out surveys. Needless to say, it doesn't quite really well with how a highly diverse set of people in terms of ages and geographies actually function in the real world. How does most innovation research happen? People fill out surveys. Maybe there's some observational work. Maybe there's some analysis after the fact. Um, but it's all very kind of periodic. And when you try and apply things like what a college freshman thinks about depends, or how you know, someone responds to a survey versus what they actually do in real life, uh, you don't get great results. Um, so today, we're going to talk about some other kinds of experimentation models. Living labs. We're going to travel a little bit into the future of where we could go with how we understand what people do and how we can change that behavior. But first, let's talk about how we got to the point where we can make such bold statements. Um, so going back in time, in the mid-1990s, uh, Sandy Pentland, who's here on the, the, my right, uh, and a uh, number of students uh, started walking around campus with this crazy stuff all over their bodies. Um, one of those students then went on to help lead the Google Glass project, uh, and uh, uh, there are a number of other pioneers of wearable computing, but it started out where we had these giant, like, head-mounted helmets, and uh, people began to experiment with the ideas of, of augmented reality and of measuring yourself. We even did some speculation about, and remember, this was 1995, about what the future might look like with these different devices and these wearable computers. Now, we're surrounded by wearables. Um, I'm sorry that the, the wearables workshop isn't happening, but uh, certainly there are a lot of other opportunities, I think, even today, uh, to hear about some fascinating applications of wearable computing. The thing that allows us to do is to go from a slice of reality, though, to seeing the big picture. Because now, we're not just sort of measuring what a survey says someone thought they want you to uh, uh, hear at some point in time, but we're measuring their behavior all the time. And this has led to a revolution in social science. So, as we all know, um, political testers are bad at predicting the outcome of elections in general, and partly it's because of how they measure. So if we measure what people actually do versus what they say or what we think they did, we get much better results, and we can even predict what's going to happen. Uh, and so we published a paper in Nature a few years ago on this urban language. It's not what people are telling you is going on in their head or what they think, it's what they're actually signaling. So, for example, if you're interested in what I'm saying, you're probably looking at me, you might be nodding your head, you might be 
you know, tapping your pencil. Um, these are all signals that can be interpreted to determine what's actually happening. So, for, for example, you know, when I'm interested in something, I tend to jog my leg while I'm sitting in a chair. You know, that activity shows my interest. Uh, another signal is mimicry. If you're in a meeting with someone and you're having a good conversation, it might be not, they might be nodding as you're talking. That does uh, uh, um, uh, indicate an empathy, and there might be, for example, if you're, if you're like this while you're talking, they might start to go like this while you're talking. And it's indicating a connection. So what do we do with that? Well, now that we know these signals, we've been able to, for example, predict Who's going to get a higher salary in a salary negotiation without knowing the content of the conversation, just looking at the signals? We were able to figure out who's going to go out on a date with each other at a speed dating event. Um, it turns out that in that particular case, uh, signals from women were the only ones that were predicted. And we were also able to correctly predict uh, who is going to win a business plan competition without seeing the merits of the business plan, but just looking at the signals and how they presented themselves. We've even been able to use it to look at psychological state. So there is an app for that. In this case, it's a spin-off company from our lab called Kojiro. Um, and you know, you'll see this diagram, so there's one person on either side and that blue bar represents who's kind of doing most of the talking. So you'll see one person is talking more than the other. Um, there's a fairly low energy level. The person over on this side has a halting speech pattern. There's what's known as low dynamism. In contrast, in this other conversation, there's a lot of overlap between the two people and there's a high flow and a high energy level. These two different kind of interpretations of signals can be used, for example, in healthcare to see indicators that uh, there's a mental health problem emerging and help with a telephone diagnosis that could lead to further intervention. Right. Well, why does this matter? But once we have these tools to measure signals and we can begin to predict what people are doing and what they're going to do, we can begin to understand idea flow. So this phone here is a tremendously powerful device. By looking at how phones are in relation to each other, we can see proximity networks. Who do you hang out with at work? Who do you spend the most time with at work? We can see who you call. What does your call network look like? We can see you know, what office building you work in and what office building other people around you work in. And of course, we can see what your social network consists of. Sorry, that's not G+. Um, it turns out that we've been able to stage interventions that, that are highly uh, uh, predictive. So now, based on these patterns of relationships, we can be much more predictive than, in this case, a traditional advertising uh, department of a telecommunications company at um, which friends are most likely to get you to download an app. And which friends uh, are not likely, if they say, oh, this is a great you know, sports information package I got from my phone, are you going to listen to them and get that same package for yourself? far higher degree of accuracy than what the sort of traditional models allow. Um, but it turns out that your Facebook friends aren't really your friends, unless they happen to be in one of these other networks. That the social network by itself can't predict who's likely to influence your behavior and get you to download an app or uh, purchase a data plan. Um, that it's the, the physical world, the real world network of people who you actually see or actually talk to on the phone who actually influence your purchasing behavior. Far more so. Um, we took this a step further and we started looking in, in this case, San Francisco. Those little dots are people. 
and the bigger dots they're starting to form are places where they go to. Because what we like to do is not just study interactions among people, but we like studying it in the real world with real behavior. These colored circles indicate clusters that are starting to show up of people who hang out with each other. Because remember, we're looking at the phone. It's showing us which phones are next to which other phones. So now we can begin to see which people are hanging out next to each other. And those clusters, even though they kind of look like blobs on, on, the, uh, uh, on the map, I'll let the animation run a little more for the, uh, the transformation. Um, those clusters begin to show us who really influences your behavior in a lot of different dimensions. OK, looks like it's not cooperating. So for example, all the red dots happen to be people who like red dresses. They're not in the same zip code. They might not even work at the same company, but they go to the same bars and restaurants, and we speculate that they're friends, even though they don't live in the same neighborhood. And this other cluster over here, um, these people have bad credit. Just think about that for a minute. Why would that happen? Well, we figured out that these groups of people are friends with each other. And if your friend's at the bar with you and says, yeah, I, I'm not going to pay my credit card bill. They can try and sue me. You are more likely to say, you know, that's a good idea. I don't think I'm going to pay my credit card bill either. It's far more predictive than the traditional credit score. It even can correlate with things like diabetes. Because if you don't exercise and eat three of those egg sandwiches from this morning, your friends are more likely to not exercise and eat three of those egg sandwiches. And this leads us to an even bigger scale experiment with three million people in a, a private social network. Um, in this case, it was uh, uh, looking at uh, um, financial trading performance, but the, the modality is not important. The importance is that people on this network could follow each other for ideas. And because it had to do with finance, we could measure the outcome of those ideas in a very simple fashion. Did they make more money or less money? And people who didn't talk to anybody and didn't have any friends and didn't listen to others had a low diversity of information. They had low idea flow. They had low social ties. And they had a low return on investment relative to everybody else. People on the other end of the curve were extremely networked. They had lots of, in this case, social network friends. Um, but they were so networked, they were living in an echo chamber, because you had a bunch of people who were sort of talking to each other and repeating back the same ideas. And it was this sweet spot in the middle where people had maximum idea diversity, but they hadn't gotten trapped in echo chambers that proved to perform the best. So the way to think about this is you want to make sure you have a lot of opinions to come up with new ideas. But you don't want too many opinions. And you want to make sure the opinions you're getting are truly diverse, and not just a bunch of people who are all saying the same thing. And so thinking about how you spread those ideas, let's go back to the group. Let's say we're having a meeting, and there are six people around the table. If one or two people dominate that meeting, it is proven to be less productive and innovative, and is scientifically less intelligence. That group will scientifically have a lower collective intelligence than uh, irrespective of, of the individual intelligence of the members. A group where everyone's contributing ideas, where you have a balanced meeting, where a bunch of people are participating equally, has a higher collective intelligence and a better productivity, and better innovation, and better idea flow. Um, so we made another app for that. Um, it's, uh, it started as a student hack and was called the Jerkometer. Um, we later called it the Meeting Mediator, but it was a little device that sat in the middle of the table. And as you were talking, the, there's a little ball in the center of the screen. It would float towards you, and it'd get paler and paler and paler because you're sucking the oxygen out of the room. 
And if someone else started talking, it started to float towards them. And so the point was to try and keep the ball in the center of the screen, and it actually ended up working uh, incredibly well. Even people who said that bogus ended up still changing their behavior and allowing for more balanced discussion. So this notion of collective intelligence is integrally tied to the idea of idea flow, which is at the core of our work in living labs. So we took a look at a company. And you can't see the labels on these boxes. I apologize very well. But this one here is management, and then development, sales, support. And then the one over on the far side there is customer service. Uh, and the blue things are emails, the blue lines. And the red lines are face-to-face -face communications. So this was an example of where we started creating a living lab inside a company to look at this question of idea flow and collective intelligence. And lo and behold, um, you see lots of emails going back and forth. The first four groups met with each other a lot. And no one really talked to customer service until suddenly there was a product launch. And then there were a lot of conversations with customer service. Um, and and they, they had a real sort of problem, because they kept pushing out products that were kind of broken. And then they had to fix them after the fact. Um, and so what we did is we looked at how people were connecting with each other. And it turns out customer service was sitting around the corner from everybody else. So this integrated product group, everyone would see each other in the hallways and talk and exchange chit chat. That chit chat, it turns out, is incredibly important to successful productivity and successful innovation. Uh, and we relocated the product group, the, sorry, the customer service group, into the middle of seating with everyone else around them. Uh, and the productivity shot up 17%. Just by identifying a flaw in the idea flow, and changing the patterns. I'll talk more about the engagement versus exploration in a minute. But this is predictive. We've even been able to do it at the, at the sort of uh, the full-on city level, not just the neighborhood in San Francisco, but entire cities across the US, um, and found that high ideal flow is highly correlated with any way of measuring innovation and productivity that you'd care to use. Patents, number of startups, GDP. The only exception to this was Washington, DC, which has a lot of idea flow, but not so much of the other stuff. So what did we learn? Well, we learned that how people talk to each other is incredibly predictive to how innovative their group is, how creative they are. We tested this on ourselves as well. We, some of these early experiments, is, experiments started out in, in, inside the media lab, but we've now bridged out beyond that. Um, we tried an interesting experiment. We, we looked at about 700 people of many ages, 18 to 60, uh, and we gave them intelligence tests. And then we gave their groups, we put them into groups, small groups of two to five. We gave their groups intelligence tests. The group would have to work for a couple hours on a task of, based on certain models. Um, and what that helped us find out is, what's the best way to put together a team? What's the optimal structure for a team? So teams that had women on them performed better than teams that were all men. And also perform better, although not, uh, not as much better, as teams that were all women. So remember what I said before about everyone wants to provide a balanced conversation in the meeting? Our data best suggests that people who have a higher emotional intelligence are going to detect those signals that say someone wants to make a comment and make a contribution, and they'll make room in the conversation for that to happen. And on average, women have tended to score higher than men on emotional intelligence tests. But when we went back and looked at the data at a very granular level, um, whether you're a man or a woman, if you have a high emotional intelligence, 
you contributed to higher collective intelligence in the group. And so it was far more predictive on the success of that group than the highest IQ of the individual member of the group or even the average IQ of the group. When you're trying to come up with, so let's say this is your network at your company and you're there, that green dot in the middle. Um, those red lines connect you to people that you see every day. Maybe they're on your team or in your department. And these other dots that are around on the periphery are other people that maybe they're outside your company, you don't talk to as much. Um, when you're trying to come up with new ideas, you do best with a high diversity of connections with people who are outside your core network, the law of weak ties. So based on measuring actual behavior, we found that, you know, we validated this notion that um, when you're trying to come up with new ideas, you want to get as many opinions as possible from outside the people you see every day because those people are likely to know the same things that you know. But when you're trying to do something that's incredibly complicated and difficult, it turns out that the people that you have the strongest ties with, your closest friends, are the ones who lead to the greatest success. This is a little different because usually you hear about the law of weak ties and six degrees of separation and you want a really diverse team with a lot of different perspectives and lo and behold, um, when you're trying to do something hard, you got to go with your, your buds. And how do you build that? I know it's old fashioned, but the water cooler actually works. Structured meetings are not what build trust. It's the accidental micro interactions. You run into somebody in the hallway. Hey, how was your day? Oh, did you see the game last night? Did you hear about the landing on the comet? Those kinds of micro interactions are incredibly important for encouraging trust to the point where then if an idea occurs to you, you're more comfortable just popping your head in someone's office and saying, hey, I want to run something by you. Which is what's necessary for those rich long term collaborations. Um, so uh, uh, the, the move to eliminate at-home workers at Yahoo, however unpopular it was, actually had some pretty solid foundation in, in uh, scientific fact. So we took all these tools and we started deploying them out in the real world with real people. So across the river at uh, MGH, We've started a living lab for health with 15,000 people, the MGH employees, to try and deliver on the promise of personalized medicine. Um, in Trento, Italy, the government there is trying to build a better rapport with its citizens and deliver better civic services. Um, at MIT, uh, you may have seen the great Bitcoin experiment uh, and other experiments will be coming that uh, take advantage of our own campus um, and in Luxembourg, we're trying to uh, do some innovative things with, uh, with the law and how people interact with the law. So imagine you had TurboTax for contracts, and now two contracts can negotiate each other, you don't have to pay the lawyer. Um, not very popular with lawyers, but very popular otherwise. And we also deploy these living labs into corporate environments, including highly creative environments. Because these living labs let us expose culture, which as Peter Drucker said, eats strategy for breakfast. So I've shared with you the notion that you know, your iPad and your phone can be this incredibly powerful sensing device that let us see what's going on. We take all that data, maybe we merge it with other data. And then we can deploy interventions that range from uh, uh, improving collaboration, improving productivity, to having better security, you name it. Because um, once you've got these devices sort of instrumented up and, and tied into the system, we could figure out that you know th these three people hang out with each other a lot and collaborate a lot and they trade a lot of emails and 
These two have lunch in the corporate cafeteria, but they don't see each other otherwise. And these two never talk to each other. But I bet if you ask them, oh, Betty, what do you think of Sally? She'd say, oh, yeah, she's great. But the data might reveal that they never talk to each other. So how can they possibly collaborate well? We don't even need to know the language because it's not about the content of the conversation. It's about the pattern of communication. Are you talking to each other? Is one person talking, the other one listening? How are you interacting? Some of our devices can even see, are you facing away from someone? So you might be standing near them, but you're not actually listening. You're sort of half listening and staring off into space. And it's predictive. So based on measuring all that stuff, we can actually predict which teams are going to do better. And once you've figured that out, you can begin to stage interventions to improve the performance of the teams that are not doing so well. Uh, there's an article in the Harvard Business Review on the new science of building great teams. So uh, low performing teams are dominated by a few individuals. High performing teams have a rich collaboration. And once you can begin to see the team dynamics, you can then lay that into the entire network of the company and figure out how's your organization doing? Could it do better? How? So we can make recommendations around things like how you construct a team. Make recommendations about how your office layout functions. Even do it on the phone. So remember that meeting app I mentioned, the, the Jerko meter? There's a phone version of it too, because in reality, you can't have all meetings in person. You do have to have phone calls. And, and even deploy it in real time and help a meeting happen better in the moment. Um, so if uh, any of these ideas struck a chord or you want to learn more, um, there's a great book called Social Physics by Sandy Pentland, um, which goes into more depth on a number of the ideas that I've spoken about today. Uh, it's available in the Kindle store as well as uh, uh, paperback, uh, hardcover, sorry. And uh, you can follow me on Twitter at David Schreier. And I think we have five minutes. OK, if there are any questions, fire away. I'll try and summarize for those who couldn't hear. Um, the question is, uh, are new forms of group chat rooms for team productivity perhaps more effective than the email or instant messenger? Uh, and has it been studied? So uh, I'll start backwards. We have studied things like instant messenger and, and sort of group messenger conversations. Um, and the way to optimize them is to kind of make a rule, and people have to stick to it, that you're always going to have your messenger app on when you're at your desk. And you can put a do not disturb, but otherwise it's expected that you can answer that quick question that's the equivalent of someone poking their head in your office and saying, hey, what do you think about X? Um, that works almost as well as a team that's in the same physical space. Um, we do a lot of work on social networks. We have not yet looked at these, the thing between instant messenger and social network of sort of a group where chat room. Uh, but we'd be happy to look at that if, uh, if someone were interested in working on that with us.
Yeah, a absolutely. I mean, the, the data is pretty unequivocal. Physical proximity is superior to any form of electronic interaction, no matter how sophisticated the user. To date. Now, when we live in a world where we can walk around with holographs of each other, that might be different. But until then, uh, uh, physical proximity is, is the best. And then the next best is some of these rule-based interaction models, like I was just describing, where everyone has to use the instant messenger when they're at their desk and to make that availability for that small micro interaction. Have the senior people say it's okay for the junior people to talk up and speak up in the room. And those caste systems intrinsically work against a creative collaboration because, again, the data shows that everyone sharing together produces a better outcome. But for me to have a current iteration, it's still like all No, we are working on. Yeah. <laughs> That's not us. <laughs> So, so, so we, we are we are looking to create a a, a meeting mediator 2.0 sometime in 2015. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It can help diagnostically, like after the fact, looking backwards, yeah. Yeah, either way, I mean, the idea sometimes is that they don't realize that they were. Yeah, sometimes they can't help themselves. Sometimes culturally, people will tend to defer, even when they're told, well, if you have something to say, speak up. When it comes down to the room, they won't speak up unless they're called out. Yeah. It, it, it can. I've also seen it backfire because people start one-upping each other. Well, I need 30 seconds because he had 25 seconds. and So having controls around that can help. But, but definitely if the senior most person speaks last, that helps a lot, if at all. So flow, you need to be able to go from space to space easily. Um, congregation points, so you need, but, so food and water are things that people sort of habitually congregate around. And so the water cooler, the kitchen, the snack machine, they can set, be set up as an inviting environment, perhaps with some couches near them. It'll encourage more conversation in those sort of accidental corridor uh, uh, interactions. So some uh, companies have actually created their layouts. You have to walk through a series of these conversation spaces to get from point to point. There are no hallways. Um, and, and then I personally would favor uh, at least glass door offices, if not glass wall, just so you can like see if someone's in and you can sort of wave to them to see if they can talk to you for a second, even if their door's closed. Um, I personally find open plan seating distracting, but it on average works better for most people in terms of that collaboration. So that that's a that's a I call it a jump ball. Check. Um, uh, can you give me an example of one of the Yeah, uh, sure. So so I'll give two examples, one of the micro and one macro. So the the, the micro level, it was literally changing the seating plan for, for a, uh, a, a corporate an office or changing the break times. So people had break, you know, when there were structured times, people were all together at the same time. Uh, and at the macro level, um, we've done interventions uh, like, so the thing I didn't really get into here was the importance of peer pressure. Um, so what your friends think about what you're doing is eight times as important to you as what you think about what you're doing. And by that I mean, uh, we tried financial incentives to get people to go to the gym. 
and uh, I'd have to give you $400 to go to the gym. If I gave your friend $50 if you went to the gym, that worked equally well. Because your friend starts nagging you, hey, did you go to the gym today? And that behavior persisted even after the money ran out. So think about the importance of your peers, peer pre you know, people whose opinion you value. All right, so I'm being told to wrap up, but I'll hang around for a couple more hours if you want to come up to me afterwards for some one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you.